All right. Well, thank you everybody for taking the time to join us right now for our Extended Reality Solutions with the Microsoft HoloLens 2 demo. Uh, what you're going to be seeing here is some live use cases that we've had experience with implementing when it comes to HoloLens 2 and mixed reality, specifically the Dynamics 365 suite from Microsoft in healthcare, as well as some of our custom solutions, which we'll touch on as well. For anyone unaware, a little bit about SphereGen as a company. We are a Microsoft Mixed Reality partner founded in 2008. We maintain clients in North America, Europe, the Caribbean, and Asia. We also maintain offices headquartered in North America, in New Haven, Connecticut, as well as with a presence in Zurich, Switzerland, and Pune, India. We maintain a specializa specialization in the healthcare industry, and we utilize agile methodology in our software development practices. We will touch on some of our products here today, and you will see some of them in demonstration. We are experienced in cloud development and run our own commercial products in the cloud, one of which is DICOM Director, which allows for CAT scan and MRI file sharing, as well as 3D visualization of those 2D scans, as well as Visograph, which is the first holographic refractive patented eye exam. So if anybody's wearing glasses or has had an, an eye exam, uh, in the future you may be doing those types of uh, diagnosis on the headset like the HoloLens using products like Visograph. Spiritian is known for three main offerings. We're here to talk about our augmented mix and virtual reality development, specifically with HoloLens 2 today. But we also have a strong practice in application modernization and application support. And under that falls in robotic things like robotic process automation, medical and science development, and EMR integration. So we are a Microsoft Mixed Reality Partner. We were the first in the Northeast to have that certification, and we're also a Microsoft Gold partner in the form of application development support. Today, we're here to talk about mixed reality. Uh, for anybody not familiar, we're going to just give a little deep dive into what mixed reality is versus some of the other realities we hear about. So the main we the main type of reality we typically hear about when it comes to wearable technology would be virtual reality. Here we have a virtual landscape, so we're in a virtual setting, a complete virtual city with a holographic representation of a robot. So we're completely enclosed in a virtual world. If I were to put on a VR headset, I could feel as if I was in Paris, France, for example, and not see my desk around me. Transition to augmented reality. Now we have a physical real world space, which we see in this living room, and we're able to take that holographic robot and place that in the space. So some of the earliest forms of this technology that can come to mind are the yellow line, for example, uh, when you watch a football game or a dotted line who might follow a golf ball in a golf. Or if you or your children use uh, apps like Snapchat, the filters in Snapchat. Which brings us to mixed reality, which we're going to be seeing here today. In mixed reality, we have the ability to take that real world space and use that same holographic robot but we're able to place that that robot behind the ottoman and between the couch so or the coffee table if you want to call it that so what we're able to accomplish here is spatial awareness we're now able to take that holographic image and we're spatially aware of the real world settings so the separation between the couch and, and the coffee table and we're able to take that holographic robot and place it in between those two real world objects and that's how we're obtaining mixed reality The headset we're going to be demoing on today is a product from Microsoft called the HoloLens 2. It's essentially a wearable computer that does recognize gestures, voice commands, spaces, and objects, and it runs in Windows 10. This headset has the capability to see everything you can see. It is able to respond to your voice, your focus, as well as your hand gestures. It can measure the rooms and the objects within those rooms. It can recognize rooms and objects, so if you leave a space and return, it will remember that space and have it mapped. It's also calibrated for the user's eyes, so it, it calibrates per user, and it is able to project interactive content, which we're going to be seeing today. What we're going to be demonstrating is Remote Assist, which is part of the Dynamics 365 suite from Microsoft. What Remote Assist allows you to do is be on site without being on location. With Remote Assist and the HoloLens 2 paired together, you're able to have a hands-free experience unlike any other. So users are able to use their hands freely while the remote specialist is able to provide direction through visible annotations, voice commands, as well as uh, share images and files in real time. Should be noted that remote assist can also be used on handhelds like tablets or your smartphone. You simply just lose the hand, hands free capability. So you're able to drop those mixed reality annotations on those same devices 
uh, you just have to use one hand to hold that, right? So the headset allows you to be completely hands free. We're also going to see from the D365 suite is guides. Uh, guides is being used to create virtualized training programs. These step through operation processes explains potential issues and how to resolve them to the user. Guides can be completely holographic or incorporate mixed uh, incorporate physical equipment and mixed reality annotations. You're able to choose from a suite of provided annotations that come out of the box from Dynamics 365, or you can create custom models and plug them into the application and the headset. Guides allows for contactless training and mentorship, so users are now able to put on a headset and complete training that typically they would have to sit with a subject matter expert or go through PDFs or hard copies of manuals. During the demonstration of guides and then afterwards as a separate demonstration, we'll be focusing on our product Intervision XR, which allows for the 3D model building and viewing. Uh, this is great for pre-surgery planning and explanation to patients, so patient consent. And with this, you're able to not only share uh, CT and MRI scans, but you're also to view them in 3D models. So what we're taking, is, what we're doing is taking the 2D and th uh, slices of the CT and MRI scans, pushing them to the cloud, and then back down to the headset to generate 3D models. We're going to see an example of that in the demo. Before we get into the live demo, there is one video, the only video that we're going to show during the presentation, but it showcases a project that we had completed with Mount Sinai Hospital in partnership with Microsoft to deliver not only HoloLens 2 wearable technology, but also remote assist out of the D365 suite to a surgeon who's sitting in New, um, sorry, sitting in Manhattan and guiding a surgery that is taking place in Uganda several thousand miles away. So here's an example of that. I want to check the have audio. Do we have audio on that? We did not. Let me reshare that with audio. Remote assist pin. Good morning, Dr. Marin. Hi, Joseph. Uh, what do you have today? We have a um, four years old girl. Shared surgical knowledge is the basis behind our program. It begins with a long standing mission at Mount Sinai to provide global surgical health to places around the world which are underserved. The Tribirwa Surgical Center in the eastern region of Uganda is a sustainable program that we can provide affordable, safe surgery to everyone. We wanted to get rid of the thought that surgery is very expensive and uh, can only be afforded by the rich. So our goal has been to look at these two questions of too expensive and too complicated and find solutions. It is unlikely to be solved by exporting or importing surgeons into regions of need, but finding more efficient ways to use technology to share surgical knowledge. Microsoft Teams and Microsoft 365 have been game changers as it relates to being able to share ideas and technology around the world. We've been able to start practicing telesurgery where I can invite the assistance of an expert from any part of the world. The Dynamics 365 with remote assist coupled with the whole lens technology allows us to have surgeons operating with Uganda completely connected with surgeons here in Mount Sinai. Through this HoloLens, Dr. Marin is able to have a real-time view of 7,000 miles away. Our team's connection provides us with an enormously interactive capability. I'm not just looking at the pictures. I can interact with those images and that video between 65 and 70 percent of surgery that's done throughout the world can be done in a facility like this. This young girl comes in with a significant problem that isn't commonly encountered in this community. It's something we see here at Mount Sinai multiple times on a weekly basis. What was your plan in terms of incisions? So my initial plan was to make an elliptical incision. Sometimes it's actually helpful to do a circular incision. I'm just going to trace out for you what I'm thinking. It was so clear now how I would have approached it would not have offered me the advantage. They're nurses, they're anesthesiologists, they're surgeons 
all get confident, get capable of doing things. So the ability to evolve in the technology allows us to really begin to think about sharing surgery in a whole new way. I readily see how we're going to begin to integrate this into our residency and surgical training programs in this institution, where we can begin to advance independent surgical skills with our surgical trainees on a more rapid basis. This will form a very important part of the next generation of education of surgeons. The HoloLens 2 equipped with dynamic 365 remote assist is just the beginning. We've gone on to treat over 400 patients and diagnose, manage over 3,000 patients. We have had 100% success rates. We've not had any fatality here. I would attribute this technology that we are using the ability to do something that can be scaled much farther beyond an individual's technical skills and take it from one person to a thousand people is one of the most exciting things I've experienced in my professional life. All right, so now we're back in action. Well, I'm muted. Um, so did we able to see the video here, obviously, of the assist video we had done with Mount Sinai? Um, but what we're here to see, right, is a live demo of this technology firsthand. And to do that, we have Jennifer LaPierre, as well as Dr. David Pearlstone from DICOM Director, to walk us through some live guidance here. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and you're going to be seeing the view directly from Jennifer's headset, which is the HoloLens 2, dialed in through a remote assist call. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, can everybody hear me? I can, yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, David Burlstone, uh, CEO of uh, DICOM Director, uh, surgical oncologist uh, by training, and uh, now here working with this amazing technology. Um, I'm joined today by Todd Cave, our new Vice President of Sales. Um, so uh, certainly um, we can be following up with him afterwards. What we're going to look at today uh, is a really great demonstration of something that's pretty common in medicine, which is a senior physician taking a younger physician through a particular activity or procedure. So what we're going to do today is Jennifer, who is in another room, she's, I can't see her, hear her, um, and she's going to uh, practice putting in a running lock suture on this suture board here. So what we're seeing, uh, you're all seeing and I am seeing directly through her view. So Jen, what I want you to do, hold on, uh, before you get started there, one second. What I want you to do is your first stitch, I want you to go about a centimeter off from the edge, about there, okay? And more importantly, I want you to come back in right opposite the same distance away, okay? So go ahead and let's see you throw that first stitch. Now really roll that edge out, roll it, cock your wrist, cock your wrist. There you go, that's it. Now you're really rolling that out, getting a full dermal bite. I like that. Very nice. Okay, now pull it through. Okay, so away here. Oops. And um, Jen, let me show you uh, something here. Hang on one second. I'm going to bring you in a photo of uh, what it is I want your thing to look like when you're all finished. Oh, it's not letting me do that now. Dr. Pearlstone, the next step on this? I'm sorry, I'm trying to upload this image for, for Jennifer. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. So you got your two things. Go ahead and throw your knot, Jen. So place your down. That's it. Surgeon's knot. Two throws over that. And I'll grab the end of the knot of the suture. See, nylon's a little tricky. It runs away from it. There you go. Now post that tie. You see that needle holder straight up in the air. Straight up in the air. There you go. And now release. Okay, very good. Second throw. All right, good, and now 
you're going to go ahead and do your do your next stitch. And what you're going to want to do, I want to see a real nice straight line of all your stitches right in there like that, okay? Of course, mine isn't a very straight line, is it? Very nice. Now, wait, what are you doing there? Hang on a second. Uh, you're grabbing the wrong ends. Let's see that again. Start that over. Pull that stitch out for me. There you go. I didn't like that at all. No, that's fine. You're fine there. No, you're fine there, but you're, you tied your knot. Now, yeah, tie your knot to the up uh, there. That has to go under. There you, okay. Not sure how we got messed up there. There you go. Pull that through. That's it. There you go. So there's a running locked. Perfect. Okay. Terrific. And we would just keep going like that down the rest of the length of that. Okay. So I think what's important to point out here, Dr. Pearlstone, and what we're trying to show people, obviously, is the ability for you to drop arrows, just as we saw in that video that was put out, right? But this is in real time. And, um, and these annotations are being delivered by you to Jennifer in the headset, right? So anything that you drop or draw is being presented to her directly in real time. Um, David has the ability to pick, you know, either arrows or drawings and change the color as well. You can also share files and videos throughout the headset um, and then as well as remove all those annotations that he were to make. So, for example, I created a, a red arrow here. And my arrow is blue. I can I can delete that annotation so it's no longer going to be visible. And David's blue arrow remains. Awesome. Are we comfortable to move on to guides, Dr. Pearlstone, or is there anything you'd like to run sure. through on this? Yeah, we've uh, sort of covered the idea. Again, um, I'm really seeing this through Jennifer's eyes. And, and as I said, you know, it's the subtleties of cocking your wrist, how you're placing those sutures. Are you really getting them exactly where you want? And that's the kind of thing that you just can't teach without really being right there as we are in the situation there's no book that's going to teach you that correctly does anyone have any questions they'd like to throw out before we move on to guides all right so the next piece we're going to show you is called guides it's part of the d365 suite as well uh that couples with remote assist and this is more so for training respect um what we can do here is anybody who has a technological background or is even really just familiar with powerpoint can create these guides uh, and they are able to be produced uh, on your pc as well as in the headset but viewed through the headset so we have one created here that's going to show how to perform cpr on a juvenile uh, child and Dr. Pearlstone also has incorporated in some 3D modeling from Intervision that we'll move on as the last piece of the demo. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, as you see, we're going to- You're on mute. Oh, I'm so, no, actually I'm not. Can you, can you not hear me? We got you now. You're good. Good, okay. Um, we're going to go through CPR, um, and specifically we're going to do CPR on an adolescent because CPR on an adolescent is different than it is on an adult, and it's different than it is on a child, and it's different than it is on an infant. Um, so again, this is the kind of thing where it's really a combination of didactics and actual practical physical maneuvers. And I think the guides uh, really um, announce it in terms of providing both of those components of the experience simultaneously in a really usable format. So again, Jennifer is now just uh, telling the computer where everything is and where her model is. And so now we're going to start the process, see if she can move that screen to wherever she wants. She's gonna put it right in front of her dummy. Show everyone the CPR dummy, Jen, real quick, just so we can see what you're working on. There's her CPR dummy. 
And you can see that blue line is telling her that her screen is coordinating with that QR code. So the computer knows where it is now. Okay, Jen, why don't you go ahead and start the CPR uh, instruction. Step one, verify scene safety. Check if the patient is responsive. Are they alert? Do they respond to verbal commands? Can you hear me? Are you okay? Okay, Jennifer, your patient gives no response. Shout for assistance and help. Activate the emergency response system if appropriate. Dr. Polestone, call 911. Okay, uh, 911 has been called. Check for patient breathing and pulse for 10 seconds. So there's a picture. This is where it gets interesting. So first there's a photograph. And now you see that blue hand. That blue hand is computer generated and it's, it's quite specific. It's two fingers. It's in a very specific angle um, in three dimensions because to find the pulse in the neck of a child is not necessarily so straightforward. So you want to come exactly at that angle with two fingers just like that. So that's showing Jennifer where to feel for the pulse. Now the other part that it's showing her is where to listen for breath sounds. That one's a little more intuitive but it is showing you a big arrow at the mouth. So Jen, go ahead and listen for breath sounds. Okay, Andrew, to feel no pulse and no breath sounds. Locate the patient's sternum and note the designated location. This is where you will place your hands for compressions. So again, another really uh, brilliant use here, I think, of the guides. Um, this could not be any more perfect and straightforward. There is an arrow exactly showing you where to place your hands. I also want to point out that sternum suddenly appeared there, that whole rib cage. That is a hologram that we created using IntraVision, which we'll talk about next. And we placed that on top of the dummy just to give you some anatomic reference. Um, so that's not really part of guides, but it's a nice supplement to guides where you can add in a holographic image to really supplement the experience. Okay, Jen, so now you know exactly where you're going to place your hands. Place your hands on the chest of the patient, interlocking the fingers of one hand over the other. This is another one. I really like this because this is a move that a lot of people get wrong about how to interlock your fingers and exactly to place the, the heel of the palm of your hand on the sternum. And again, you can see that quite specifically. It's not your fingertips. It's not the bottom of your fingers on the sternum. It's the bottom of the palm of your hand. Um, okay, Jen, so you've got your right position there. Perform cycles of 15 compressions and two breaths. When a second rescuer arrives, take turns performing compressions to avoid fatigue. Use an AED as soon as it is available. Okay, now again, it's going to show her. One, two, where, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. See that? It showed fifteen compressions. Breath. And so it says two arrows for two breaths. Breath. Mouth. 15 more compressions. Notice showing you the timing, the depth that you should be pressing. Um, it's really giving you a tremendous amount of information here that is uh, not random. Exactly how those fingers are placed um, uh, and the timing of the compressions and the depth of the compressions are all accurate. Continue CPR and look for signs of the return of spontaneous circulation. So again, we're going to see check for the pulse. And this time, Jennifer, you do feel a pulse. Congratulations. Another life saved. Another CPR dummy saved. Very good. Very well done. Um, Thank you both. Any questions on that? I really love this as a physician, as an educator. Um, it's just, it's a real game changer to use an open expression. The ability to do this and to record it so that I could look at the recordings of 15 of my students doing this and grade them on how well they did it just based on this video and, and watching them do it. Um, as I said, I think this is going to change a tremendous amount of medical training. 
And for anybody who's not familiar with the headset or hasn't had a chance to actually wear one, uh, the white dot that you see in the center of the screen, that's the cursor and that's uh, tracked with the headset. So whenever Jennifer's moving her head, that's the cursor she's able to move on screen to screen or navigate while being hands free. She could also engage her hands if she needed to, uh, to make these sort of prompts throughout the process. For example, she's moving the screen right now, placing it where she wants it to be placed um, with her hand, obviously. But then if she goes to the blue arrow, for example, to the right to transition to the next screen, uh, that can be done with her vision, for example, right here. Uh, to Dr. Pearlstone's point, not only is this great because it can be recorded and those sessions can come back, come back to and viewed, but the headset itself is able to capture data that can be viewed in the back end. So uh, not only is if, if Jennifer were to hand this off to me, for example, and I were to run through this training, um, in the back end, a trainer can take a look at the data and might see that it took me 15 minutes as opposed to the eight minutes it took the other trainees. Uh, perhaps I need some extra guidance or perhaps you identify that there's a certain step that everybody gets hung up on and uh, the revision might be more focused on the actual training program as opposed to the end user. Uh, some neat, neat perks of guides in general. Uh, as Dr. Perlson, instead, any questions before we... Go ahead, Dave. Uh, no, I just, I just said that's a really great point you, uh, that you just made about in, in training. That's very interesting. Um, so we're going to go on now to uh, talking about introvision. Um, and Jennifer is, uh, all she's going to do is switch to a different program in the HoloLens now. Um, so you'll see we've got guides closed, and now she's going to open DICOM Director. Uh, DICOM Director, uh, we do an, a number of products, but what we're going to be talking about here is specifically our product called IntraVision. IntraVision uh, can take any CAT scan or MRI scan and convert it into a three-dimensional model. Now, those three-dimensional models are terrific, and they look okay on a computer. But to really appreciate them, you see them on a virtual reality headset or augmented reality headset, such as Jennifer is wearing. So she's actually um, accessed her account on the system, and she's thumbing through all of these holograms that she's made. Jennifer is one of the uh, most proficient hologram makers uh, in the world right now, probably a few thousand she's made in her time. So she's selected one of a skull, and we're going to open that now. When you make a hologram from a CAT scan, one of the very first important steps is you have to tell the computer what it is you want to see of the CAT scan, because the CAT scan obviously will show you all structures. So a process called segmentation is the means by which we can tell the computer, I want to see bone, I want to see blood vessel, I want to see liver parenchyma, et cetera, et cetera. So in this one, we've segmented just for bone. But here's the real beauty of it. It's a CAT scan. So you don't just see the outside. You can walk inside of this model. It's not projecting terribly well. I apologize because of the, all the uh, reproduction through the video. But um, every anatomic detail of the inside of that skull is absolutely correct. In fact, I can see this from here. This patient has a broken nose. Um, so it's, it's really rather remarkable. Um, we have models of a, a variety of, of different structures. If anyone has um, the questions or anything particular you'd, you'd like us to try to bring up. Um, but as a surgeon, I found this to be a rather remarkable tool in terms of surgical planning and just surgical planning of patient education alone is, is really going to change the way we do things. Where it gets very interesting is you start talking about using this actually in the operating room and superimposing that image on top of the actual patient, which you can do. And now you have X-ray vision because you can see everything the CAT scan shows you superimposed on top of the patient. So it really is rather remarkable. Jen, why don't you go ahead and make that real big? So you can, you can see she can rotate it, she can size it, and spin it around. Let's see the frame and magnum again. There you go, she can rotate it around. So um, if you're a neurosurgeon, this is the place you want to work. I like that view, go in right to the brain stem. So you can see there's no brain tissue here. All we see is the bone, so Jennifer can stick her head right through that hole, which is where your spine comes out of your brain. And now we're looking inside the calvarium. 
Um, every little bump you see there on the Calgary is real. Uh, those are from the CT scan. You can see we've picked up a little bit of artifact, some of those floating dots, just based on the way that we've segmented this. In fact, those are very likely quite real. This is probably vascular calcifications in the brain. Um, yeah, somebody's got a question there. I see a raised hand. Yeah, go ahead, Aaron, if you want to voice yours. Yeah, hi, Chris. Uh, hi, Doc. It's uh, Aaron with Microsoft. I do have a okay. question since we're, we're starting to learn more and more about the use cases of these. Can you segment out colors on a on a 3D rendering? For instance, bone is going to be gray like it is. Uh, the blood vessels, you can choose a color and then, and then capture the entire image um, and then just sort of look at the holistic you mean uh, like this we're about to show you <laughs> no i jumped the gun sorry no perfect that's what we call a good segue so <laughs> this, is really nice, this is a nice one again i apologize it, jennifer is seeing this a lot clearer than we are on a double transmission through tvs the in this one the lungs and trachea are colored green and just kind of pop in through the chest wall there jen and you see this patient has a t4 lung cancer is blue. So as we go inside the patient's lung, and again, I apologize, it's crystal clear through the hollow lens, you can see the tumor colored blue uh, inside the chest wall and then also spin around now from the outside, Jen. Um, oh, made it blink. Oh, I might have lost it. Um, yeah. Here, let me come back in. It moved away. Um, but yeah, so to, to your point, absolutely, we can color and what we're going to be rolling out soon is uh, um, variable adjustments on the transparency. You can see in this particular model, the green's a little dark, a little dense. I'd like it a little bit lighter. Um, so we're going to be rolling that that adjustment in as well. I think you got too many things open, Jen. That's why you got to I might have accidentally opened two or three of the same application, which is Great. poor stewardship for the. <laughs> so I'll help. I'll help. Aaron, did you have smaller. a question? I just said I'll help feed some of the science. I have, I have a question while you're doing that. So if, for instance, you do see the vessels inside of a skull as well as the bone, are you able to subtract on the fly? So, for instance, you just want to see the vessels. Are you able to subtract the, the bone from that whole model? Do I get to say this again? You mean like this? <laughs> oh, again. Over on the right-hand side is where you can add in or take out. So we have two segments here, lung, there. There's no lung, just the tumor. Gotcha. Okay, great. Thank you. There's the lung back in. So, yeah, and there's no limit to the number of segments we can do. Limited by the number of colors you can come up with. And outlines of segments, too. Sorry, last question, I promise. If Please, you wanted no. to yeah. If you want to isolate that cancer, but still wanted some sort of transparency around the lung. Can you do that? Well, again, that's what we're, we're um, in our next rollout, um, um, be able to you know, change, change the density of the lung to a barely visible or downright solid. Great. That's Thank you very much. Thank you. That's a great question. And, I, and I, uh, it's an important um, ability uh, is to, to change the coloring, the segmentation, and, and the transparency. You, you, you hit exactly on the major issue in this area, which is segmentation. That's the name of the game here. And I'm very proud to say that our team has developed some really rather impressive segmentation uh, modules. Uh, we are now about to begin work on an artificial intelligence machine learning based module for segmentation. Our goal is to um, basically click a button that says liver and it will give you the choices. What do you want to see? Parenchyma, portal vein, uh, hepatic artery, hepatic vein, bile duct, or tumor. Add in, take out any ones you want, and it'll just all be done automatically. It, the other thing to realize about these things that we're showing you, these that model Jennifer's showing you came right out of our computer. There's zero artistic change on it at all. That And it took 10 minutes to make, maybe, something like that. In fact, I'll even go one step further. This was made by a medical student who had used our software for about two weeks. And after two weeks, maybe not even two weeks, he could make what I consider one of our most impressive models. Um, we can do a virtual bronchoscopy on this. Kind of show that, Jen, if you can, for a quick sec. Um, you can basically go into the trachea here and follow the trachea down and the bronchi down. 
it's a little again hard to see. I apologize. Watch. She's going to go right into the trachea, and then she's going to take a hard left into the right main stem. And you can actually go all the way out in bronchi out to where the tumor is. Again, I apologize. Difficult to appreciate on this imaging, but um, there she is all the way out to the tumor in a virtual bronchoscopy. You know, again, I think of this as uh, use as guidance for thoracic surgery and for minimally invasive approaches. Change everything. Other questions about this? I'm, I get very excited about uh, holography. I think it is absolutely a very, very important future tool in, in, in healthcare, certainly in surgery. We will be using this kind of three-dimensional image on a daily, daily basis very shortly. Well, thank you, Dr. Burlstone. I appreciate it. Um, that wraps up the live part of the demos here that we have. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left, so of course we can field questions or if anybody wants to revisit uh, anything that we've showcased, we're happy to take a step back and, and look at that. But um, at this point, I'll turn it over to the audience. Uh, it looks like we're remaining quiet here. So if there are no other questions, I'll give it another minute or two. Uh, happy to hang on. Hey. And, and again, we can. Yep. Hey, Chris, I'll, I'll sure. see if I I'll see if I can help out from the Microsoft side a little bit. Um, sure. Is there and again, I, I know some of these answers, but I think it's important to get them out there. If a surgeon yep. on the other end of the hollow lens decides that he likes the way something looks on a, uh, a DICOM image, a 3D DICOM image, can he print something right from the HoloLens uh, transparency screens. Can he actually do that? I'm going to punt that one up to either Dr. Pearlstone or maybe Andrew, if I can. That that that's, a, that's, a, that's a really interesting idea. Um, I mean, yes, that can be converted into a 3D printing command. Yeah. But break from HoloLens, I don't know. Yeah, so that's my interest is if they could print on a 2D piece of paper right from one of those screens that is transparent on the HoloLens, and even better, how about a 3D print of something? Uh, you know, people have 3D printers now. Print out a 3D printer. Jen, you know what? Before you just blog off, Jen, you know what? We didn't show cutting plane. Can you just demonstrate that? Because we're talking about getting two-dimensional two images. Um, and, and I think maybe this will answer your question. So we developed a, a very, very clever uh, way of looking at the uh, CAT scans. Um, so, Jan, you got to go ahead and open that back up if you could. Um, that I think gets to possibly your question about making two-dimensional uh, prints of something. So, Aaron, in, in regards to printing on a 3D model, the, we are truly 3D models uh, that you're visualizing. So, um, the FBX files or BJ files could be downloaded and printed by any standard 3D print uh, application. Okay, very cool. And um, I promise you, last question. This is such exciting stuff that I just I can't stop myself. Keep Mul it coming, man. We love it. Don't stop. Don't stop. <laughs> Mul multiple HoloLens users on the back end can, if a surgeon is standing over a patient, can other folks wear hollow lenses in the room and see exactly what the, the, the de deriving surgeon is at Mount Sinai? Yes. Okay, so they can be connected so everybody sees the same thing. Well, again, that's remote assist. That's exactly what a remote assist is doing. And, and you don't even have to be in the same room. But, but maybe perhaps to your point, um, having Mike Marin uh, uh, walk a surgeon in Uganda through a procedure has tremendous value. That's terrific. But here's another interesting idea. How about the person you're communicating with is on the other side of the OR table from you? And the value of that, I think, is in teaching and education. You can watch somebody do an operation, what we call, from the other side of the table, meaning you're the assistant. The hologram? Doing, hologram? Yeah, well, now, instead of watching it from the other side of the table, I'm wearing a HoloLens, and I'm seeing it from the same angle the surgeon sees it from. Okay. So um, that, that's a, 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 big, uh, a big advantage, I think. So now Jen's going to demonstrate our cutting plane technology. So you see we have this plane, and we can move the plane around relative to the hologram. And when it goes through the hologram, 
you get what we call in CTs sections. So if we put this straight flat up and, and moved it backwards, it would be a coronal section. If we went there yeah, like that, so there's a sagittal section now. So put it on there, Jen, and then walk over and show a nice, pretty sectional view. So there you go. Okay, now go and look at it. Push it in a little further. So there you go. Okay, so stop like there. All right, so now we're, you can, you know, this yep. would be a sagittal view on the CT scan, um, but you can have any sagittal view, any view you want on the fly. Um, you know, normally you have, would have to get your CT scan reprocessed to have them give you sagittal views, coronal views. We can give you a view, any view you want from any angle. So to answer your question about 2D printing, 3D printing, yeah, you can take the data feed and put it into a 3D printer and print a 3D model, but you can also take a screen grab of this and create any 2D image at any section orientation that you like, which again, I think is a real advantage. Thank you very much. There's so many possibilities in every industry I could think of with this. Absolutely. I mean, it's not just healthcare, it's everything. Oh yeah. All right, Chris, I, <laughs> I'm done. No worries, no worries. You know, at least uh, I know where you're coming from the Microsoft side, but uh, for anybody else still on the call, whether you know, you're with Microsoft or you're with a, a different organization, um, to Aaron's point, you know, we have experience not only in healthcare implementing this technology, but uh, in areas like engineering, construction, as well as manufacturing. So um, being able to help uh, break fix equipment, uh, let alone break fix a person, right? These things are, are uh, not industry specific. You're going to start seeing this technology across the board, um, whether it's, you know, in, in the area, office. One area, I'm sorry to interrupt, one area we didn't really talk about that uh, is interesting. Obviously, I'm a surgeon. I see everything through a surgeon's eyes, right? I, all, all the world is a scalpel to me. Um, That's right. So, but we're really, I think, some of the best activity for this is going to be in the world of minimally invasive approaches, essentially uh, catheter-based surgeries, whether it's interventional cardiology, interventional pulmonology, interventional radiology, all of those procedures where you're doing a rather extraordinary, complicated procedure completely based on your visualization. You are looking inside the patient using an instrument that's at the end of a 30 inch long catheter. Um, and having this level of imaging, I think is really gonna make um, those areas, you know, the cath lab, the interventional radiology lab, and, and, and the medical ICU now with pulmonology, um, I think we're gonna see great advances by having this kind of technology available. Certainly, and, and Dr. Perlston, as you well know from the conversations we've been in, um, not to you know give away too much information on, on private clients, but um, just in general, you know, not only from the surgeon's standpoint, but from the medical device manufacturer standpoint, uh, we're looking at limitations of having the reps be in the surgical theater anymore due to COVID, right? Uh, now we're looking at how can we not only implement the headsets for surgical benefit, for the patient benefit, um, whether it's pre-surgery planning or coaching, you know, through a surgery, but how does it affect all the way back up through the supply chain? Now, if our surgeons can use less products during the surgery, right? We're using less of the instruments that med device manufacturer supplied, or uh, if they used to supply maybe an array of 15 joints for a specific shoulder surgery, for example, um, is there a way to use 3D imaging, headsets, wearable technology to narrow down, okay, we know we only need these three implants as opposed to giving the surgeon 15. Uh, we've now cut down our need to produce these uh, products, ship them out, and return back anything that's not used. So uh, the impact here can be can be seen on a lot of different levels. And uh, SphereGen, of course, is thrilled to be a part of that and a part of the work that we've done either with Microsoft and with our cl and clients. So greatly appreciate you know Aaron the questions. Anybody other has any other questions, feel free to reach out. We'll happily field them for you. Or if we don't have the answers, we'll uh, we'll definitely put you in touch with people we think that would. But um, yeah, we still got some time here. So, Aaron, if you got a few more in your basket, fire them off. If not, uh, Chris, we did, do agree. you had mentioned about device manufacturing. Uh, and again, sure. not to get into specifics about anybody's uh, particular business, but we are working uh, with a company that's using our technology now, uh, making cardiac valves. They're particularly interested in making them for infants. Oh, well, I lost you on audio, David. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Ted, can you hear me? I got you back now. Yep. Sorry, I was too loud. Um, so they're making heart valves, particularly for infants. Well, 
you don't want to be, you know, trying to size your heart valve on an actual baby on, you know, the first time you're trying to see if it actually fits. Uh, so they're designing their valves using holographic models of different infant hearts, which of course makes tremendous sense rather than experimenting, if you will, trying out, does this fit, does that fit on the actual baby? We can do it on a hologram um, and design valves that fit better without having to, quote, do the experimenting on, on humans or animals or anything else. Exactly. Yep. Thank you for that. Hey, Chris, last question. Can you pull up two images next to each other on if you choose a DICOM image? Or, or is it only or you're limited to just one in front of you? I'll the pop hologram. that to David. The holograms is just one as far as I know. Interesting question. We're going to ask that before. Um, as far <laughs> as I know, one. I don't know, Ted, what do you think? I guess you. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we only do one because we're only working on one part of the body and the patient at any given time. So um, for, for surgery, we really want to focus on one with the segmentation. But Aaron, as you know, as you know better than I do, there are some really fascinating things coming down the pike from your company uh, about things like that. So, yep. it, yeah, it'll happen. Cool. I heard there was an award for a HoloLens for the most questions asked. <laughs> Why not? We, we do. I tell you one thing that we really enjoy that's been a lot of fun. And please, if any of the guests are interested in this in any way, we would love to do it. We run hackathons for medical students. Uh, Jennifer, uh, who's been demoing for us, who, by the way, Jennifer is our um, director of medical anatomic imaging, uh, and she has been absolutely terrific. She's um, returning to medical school at Dartmouth this year, but she has been a, a, an extraordinary resource for us in, uh, in making the images. Um, Oh, the hackathon, right. So she had arranged the hackathons. Now we've done a couple of them. And um, the medical students have been amazing. Uh, I, I don't think it's a leap that this technology is very future oriented. And we are seeing a bit of a generation, I don't know, barrier, if you will. There's a certain age at which surgeons just, to be honest, they just don't get it. But you show this to anybody under the age of 40, and they absolutely get it. And when you show it to med students, it's not that they get it, they're demanding it. Why should we have to learn anatomy on a disgusting, greasy, old dead body when I can learn it on a hologram? And they're absolutely right. So we really love the idea of getting the med students involved early, and they've been a great help to us. Um, but we're really trying to spread the gospel uh, early amongst the med students and have them just be really versed in this when they get out and hit their residencies. By the time they're done with residency, this generation of med students will be expert at this by the time they finish their training. That's exciting. It certainly is. All right, that that will give back everybody back ten minutes of their day, I believe. Um, of course, you know, feel free to reach out with us. Any questions come up or anything, you know, as you brainstorm later on after seeing this comes to mind, you have curiosities about, you know, what could be possible or what is possible, what's currently in action. We are certainly looked at as a resource in that world. Um, so please reach out. Really greatly appreciate your time and joining us here today. And uh, we'll leave you back. So thanks so much.